Amen. Praise the Lord. Good to have you all with us tonight. Um, let's see. I want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you tonight. We are glad that you have joined us. I'm dressed a little wintry because it's so cold out. So I don't have suits on and ties and all that good stuff. <clears throat> Tonight's lesson, we're going to deviate from the book a little bit. Um, but we're going to stay with hermeneutics. We're going to stay with the teaching on how to interpret the Bible. But tonight's lesson is going to be how not to interpret the Bible. Now, um, as, I re as I was studying this and then going over this, I... I was amazed, and I've always told you this, um, and I'm a big fan of commentaries. If you go in my office, you'll see volumes and volumes of commentaries. You see um, books that are written about the Bible by different authors, and uh, I'm not disparaging any kind of uh, study of commentaries, but you have to be careful. A commentary is exactly what I just said. It's a commentary by a person. It's a comment about a person. And sometimes what they make Scripture say is not exactly what it says. So I want to share with you tonight, and um, the commentary I'm going to share with you, you might get a little angry at me, or you may uh, not have noticed that it's uh, something that you have on your shelves or even in your lap. But um, it's something that I really feel strongly that I need to bring out on how not to interpret the scriptures. And um, we're going to go, we're going to be talking about Romans chapter 6 and 7 again uh, tonight. But, uh, but the commentary I want to, um, I want to share with you tonight is going to be found in, in a bunch of uh, scripture commentaries that I have taken specifically from a certain commentary uh, that I found uh, and was very, very um, upset about this when I saw this. So um, you're going to say, okay, pastor, what commentary is it? Well, it comes from the Jimmy Swaggett Bible. And you're going to be amazed when I show you some of the things that he's teaching that is so far off base. It's unbelievable. Okay, not that the Bible itself is bad, but the commentary and how the exposition of the Scripture is and how the expounding of the Scripture is, is done very, very carelessly. And uh, I'm just amazed uh, knowing that he has so many scholars around him that they truly believe some of these things. So I'm going to ask if, uh, Jess, if you'll put that uh, slide up, if you will. Uh, it may be a little bit hard. I don't know if you can see it. If you can't, move forward. Come sit forward. There's no, I won't bite you. Uh, but if you can see it from there, fine, stay where you are. But if you can't see that, I want you to come up closer because I want you to see something that's here. This is taken right from the, from, right from the commentary notes. And so what, we're going to, what I'm going to show you tonight is this. And thank you, brother. Come on up. I, really, why don't you all come forward a couple of, couple of seasons? Yeah, it, it's not going to, Mount Grandma, you're okay right there. Let's go from Grandma on up. Come on. We, we don't bite. We don't smell. We, we put deodorant on today, and we have uh, deodorant and stuff like that. So uh, just come on down you know, like the price is right. Come on down. You're the next contestant on the price is right. You know, just come on down, and uh, you can see. Well, come on this side. <laughs> Good, okay? Good. And you get a little more heat, too, with the fan running and getting the heat. Okay, one of the things uh, that he says in Romans chapter 7, we went through the book of Romans, right? So you should have a good grasp on this. Okay? But I want to show you how not to interpret the Bible. Here he says, when, uh, uh, where Paul says, I die, he says he was not meaning that he physically died, and we understand that to be true, as would be obvious, but that he died to the commandments. In other words, 
He failed to obey no matter how high he tried. Let all believers understand that if the Apostle Paul couldn't live for God in this manner, at least successfully neither can you. <laughs> now, we would have to go really in depth into this, okay? but I'm not going to do that tonight. Okay? But I just want to read some of these scriptures to you. In verse 11, this is, oh, 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 I don't want to do that. No, 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 no. I don't want to do that. Let me see, can I do this? Press yes again. No, I don't want yes again. How, how do I get rid of that? Huh? Okay, thank you. Okay, in verse 11 of chapter 7, look what he says. For sin, the sin nature taken occasion by the commandment in no way blames the commandment, but the commandment actually did ag ag agitate the sin nature and brought it to the fore, which it was designed to do. Deceive me. Paul thought now that he had, ex Paul thought now that he ex had accepted Christ by that mere fact alone, he could certainly obey the Lord in every respect, but he found he couldn't. It's amazing. And neither can you, at least in that fashion. And it slew me. Despite all the efforts to live for the Lord by means of law keeping, he failed again, and I say, so will you. Verse 9, for I was alive without the law once. This is really something. Paul is referring to himself personally and his conversion to Christ. The law, he states, had nothing to do with that conversion, neither did it have anything to do with his life in Christ. That's true. But when the commandment came, he says this, having just been saved and not understanding the cross of Christ, he tried to live for God by keeping the commandments through his own strength and power. <laughs> not understanding the cross of Christ? Paul? Not understanding the cross of Christ? You're telling me that Paul, the apostle, didn't understand the cross of Christ. And that's what he's saying. Where do you get that in this interpretation? Here's where the mix-up comes in. Now, I've read commentaries back and forth on both sides. Some say Paul wasn't saved at this time, and some say he was saved at this time. Um, and I don't get it. I was always taught when you read scripture, it has to be, and you've heard me say this over and over and over again, in context. Right? Okay. Remember the who, what, when, where, why? Questions you ask when you're trying to look for a meaning of in Scripture. But before we do that, I, I, wanna, I just want to go somewhere. Could you f just get out of that for a minute and give me 1 Corinthians 9, 20 and 22? Paul here is speaking to the Corinthian church. And how many know that Scripture interprets Scripture? We've been teaching that, right? Okay. And unto the Jews, this is Paul speaking. Paul is the author of the book of Galatians, right? We all, we all know that. We all understand that. Paul is writing this, and he says, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. And to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. Question. When did he do that? When did he become a Jew? He's a Jew. He's already a Jew. So it had to be a specific time where he, he says, and unto the Jews I became as a Jew. In other words, when he was witnessing to the Jews, or he was talking about Christ to the Jews. We understand that during the time of Paul's ministry, whether it be in Galatians or it be in Romans, that there were certain Jews that were converted and even during in Timothy's time, when the Jews said, in order to be saved, you must be circumcised. 
You must obey the law. There was a constant conflict with the new converted Jews that they were saying that they were made righteous by observing the, the, the Torah, the Ten Commandments. How many know none of us are, are made perfect or righteous by the Ten Commandments? The Ten Commandments, the Bible says, was given to show us how sinful we really are. And that by the Torah or by the law, no man will be justified. So there had to be a time when Paul, he became a Jew, he came like a Jew or as a Jew, that he might gain the Jews and to them that are under the law as under the law. When did that take place? Huh? Yeah, it happened after his conversion, but when? When did he do this? Look at Romans chapter 7, verse 1. He says this, Know you not, brethren. Stop for a moment. Who's he talking to? How do you know that? Because I, <laughs> I told you last time you wrote it in the book. <laughs> okay, how you can qualify that? Not because I just said so, okay? <laughs> okay, how you can qualify that? Who is he speaking to? Well, you know not, brethren. And then he gets in parentheses, for I speak to them that know the law. Do the Gentiles know the law? No. Gentiles don't care about the law. The law was given to Israel, the children of Israel. So he says, I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. This is when he becomes like a Jew or under the law as that he might win those that are under the law. So he's speaking to the Jewish Believers who are still trying to struggle to become made perfect and righteous by observance of the law, of the Torah. So you see the classification that he's not, it's, and, and when he talks about, you know, I am the chief of sinners and I am this and I am that, yes, he's talking in the, in the now person, but he's describing himself, and always remember that, from the very beginning, he's describing himself as under the law. He's a Christian, but he's describing himself when he was under the law. He said, when I was under the law, the things I didn't want to do, I didn't. The things I, I wanted to do, I didn't do. Yes, he was a Christian. I don't understand why they say, some say he wasn't saved, some say he was saved. He was saved, but he was describing himself as being under the law. Now, Go back to that chart that I had. There is no way, absolutely no way, that what he's saying here, having just been saved and not understanding the cross of Christ, he tried to live for God. There's no way that that's true because, first of all, Paul was saved for 10 years before he wrote the book of Romans. And not only that, he didn't learn the things that he learned. He got it by revelation of Jesus Christ. We know he went away and he, and he got all that by the revelation of Jesus Christ. I mean, if any man didn't understand the, the cross, why did he say it is no longer I that liveth, but Christ lives in me in the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God? If he didn't understand that, why would he write in Romans chapter 6, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Likewise, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that we should walk in newness of life. Why did he say all those things in Romans chapter 6 if he didn't understand the cross? I found that crazy. Then verse 15. Oh, let's go back here. Having just been saved, and not understanding the cross of Christ, he tried to live for God by keeping the commandments through his own strength and power. Nowhere in the scripture does it say that. It doesn't say that. So what he's doing is called eisegesis. What he's doing is he's putting the meaning that he thinks that it means into the scripture and therefore commenting on it. Now he's entitled to his opinion and he can write down and make commentaries all he wants to. But I'm telling you that grammatically and contextually 
It is not scriptural. It is not a scriptural teaching. To think that Paul, because he was a young Christian, according to him, doesn't know about the cross, when God gave him revelation to almost two-thirds of the entire New Testament, how can he say that? Now, I know I'm going to get a lot of flack on Facebook for this. I know people, some people are going to tune in, they're going to tune out. But you know what? I'm telling you the truth. Okay? And there's a, there's a commentary I have on Romans by a rabbi, and I'll tell you, what he, te- what he goes into detail about this, is, there's no way it means what he says. Absolutely none. Because you have to understand. He says, look, look in verse 7. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a, a man as long as he liveth. And then what he does is he brings in the covenant relationship of marriage. And he talks about marriage and how marriage is a covenant relationship, but you know, when, the woman, when the man dies, the woman is free to be a husband, someone else's husband, and, and the marriage is dissolved. Because in the same way when he says you die to the law, you're free from the law. Okay? And look at the, look at the language that he uses here. He says, wherefore, my brethren, you, verse 4, wherefore, my brethren, you are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ. You're dead to the law. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't obey the law. But you don't obey the law to obtain righteousness. You've already got the righteousness of Christ when you accepted Christ. So you have the righteousness of Christ. But you obey the law, right? You don't, you know, you don't um, commit adultery, you don't steal, you don't swear, you don't lie. All those things, that's part of the commandments. Okay? You love your neighbor as yourself. You know, uh, Love Christ with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Those, those are commandments. But we obey them, but we don't obey them for righteousness. We obey them because we have a new nature and we can choose to obey them freely. So he says here, Wherefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that we should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Verse 5. Put for verse 5 up there for me. Look at this. For when we, he uses the plural we, including himself, right? He didn't say For you, he says, for we were, past tense. He didn't say we are. He said you were in the flesh. What does he mean that? Are we all in the flesh tonight? If we were talking about the body, yes. But we're not. He said, for we were in the flesh. So he's not talking about your natural body because, of course, we're all in the natural body. So what does the word flesh mean? It comes from the Greek word socks, S-A-R-X, socks, where we get the human nature or fallen nature. He says, for when you were in the fallen nature or the flesh, when you were in that place where you were not saved, when you were in that place where you obeyed sin and you just continue to do whatever you wanted to do and sin and never thought anything, two things about it. Right? So he uses the past tense here. Now, let me, let me get this very clear so people don't misunderstand. I am not talking about eradication. I'm not saying that your old nature is taken out. It's not taken out. Okay? But if you read Romans chapter 6, it says, knowing this, that our old man, and that's not you, Nelson, and that's not you, Tom. And that's not me. Your old man was crucified with Christ. Oh, so I forgot Louis too. Okay. Your old man was crucified with Christ. Your old man was crucified with... What does that mean? That means that when you were being controlled by that old nature, when you were being controlled by that sinful nature, now we're no longer under its control. Now we're free from that. Now that doesn't mean that we can't choose to. Okay, you can still choose. But he says, For when you were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death.
Look at verse 6. But now, say now. now. We are, present tense, delivered from the law. He's explaining to the Jewish believers that he was once alive, and you'll see they said, when I was alive to the law, he said, it was the time I was alive apart from the law, but when the law came, sin came, and, I, and, and death was found in me. I was, you know, sin was there. But he says, that being dead wherein we were held, but now we are, we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in what? Newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now, I want to say, but now are we delivered. That word delivered from, in the Greek means separate from. To remove or to cause idleness. And I've said this for many, many years. I said, it's like your sinful nature is, you know, like you have park in your car, and then you have drive, and you have low, and then you have reverse, right? But you have a neutral. And your sinful nature, when you, you've been crucified with Christ, your nature is, instead of, putting into, instead of being in drive, which is always how you used to live, you used to swear, curse, do all kinds of things, use the Lord's name in vain, you know, go out and have all kinds of parties and drink and drunken and and get drunk and not think too twice about it, get high on drugs, whatever you did, whatever your sin was, whatever you participated in, and you never thought about it. You just go and went out and did it. But now, it bothers you. You feel bad about it. You don't live in it. You may occasionally fall, but you don't live in it. Can I get a good Amen. You're separated from it. It's rendered idle. But I want you to understand this. We, Paul is including himself. I hope you see what I'm trying to share with you. I hope you see what not to do when interpreting Scripture. Don't put your ideas into it. Get the meaning of it out. And unfortunately, that's what has happened in the commentary. Go uh, Now, bef before we go back to that again, I, I, I just want to read something to you. Listen to this. This is a direct quote from Jimmy Swaggart. Direct quote. Other than the people that this ministry has touched, other than those who have turned into this program or Francis's program or Donnie's program or whatever the case, Gabe, whatever the case might be, other than that, not a single solitary believer Around the world, now this is where he leaves himself with an out. To my knowledge, has heard a message on the sinful nature. I'm going to read it again. Listen to it. Not a, apart from his ministry, apart from his teaching, apart from his wife's teaching, his son and his grandson's teaching on their program, this is what he said. Not a single solitary believer around the world, to my knowledge, has heard a message on the sinful nature. Let me ask all of you here that have been here for years, have you heard messages on the sinful nature? And that's years ago. And he says this, and of course there is still a lot more, of course, that can be said, but this is the single most important material of the believer to know and understand. And you consider that, and consider that there isn't anyone out there 
like I said, to my knowledge, other than those who have tuned in this ministry, tuned in this ministry, who ever know what you're talking about. They never heard a message on the sin nature. They never had their pastor to teach on it. And it's, I know, com coming up in church, and he goes on about his church, he says, I mentioned this the other day, whenever Francis and I went into evangelistic works, every city we went into, we went into scores over 20 years of time. I would go into used bookstores, and I would look for books. I saw the video of this. This is a transcript, but I saw the video of him, him talking exactly this. He says, over 20 years, I would go to the used books, and I would look for books of some of the great Bible scholars of the past, even preachers of the past, and I bought hundreds and hundreds through the years and read all of them. I never read one single message by some of the greatest Baptist preachers who ever lived, Methodists who ever lived, Pentecostals, etc., etc., etc. Never read one message, not one single time, on this all-important subject. Then another minister chimes in and he says this, I'm sorry, can I make this statement? You said that earlier, you doubt that as a church. Anywhere out there, outside of the influence of SBN, that this message of sin nature has been preached. I, too, have never heard of any message regarding sin nature until this revelation was given to you. He's talking to Swaggart. I don't have anything about, against Brother Swaggart. But when you start saying stuff like this, that they're the only ministry that he has never heard, I'm going to tell you, okay, he hasn't looked very far. I posted back in the other church years ago on the back poster board, The Old Cross and the New Cross by A.W. Towser. I reposted that on Facebook. Okay. Andrew Murray. Watchman Nee. B.H. Clendenin. All of these men have written books on the sinful nature. You can't open up a theological book. Lectures to my students. Henry, Henry Thiessen. Teaching on the sinful nature. Boswell. Baptist preacher. Book on theology. Systematic theology. The sinful nature. Charles Hodge, theological three-volume set, talks about the sinful nature. So I don't know where he gets saying that he has never heard or read of any of the biblical Baptist preachers that have anything that he's ever read on the sinful nature. You've got to be kidding me. I don't know if someone in his ministry is, is giving him this theological imbalance. He better stop listening to them. But to say that the Apostle Paul is, didn't know about the cross? And if you go back and you continue to read through chapter 7, in verse um, 6, uh, verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? He says, God forbid. No, I would not have known Sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking the occasion of commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Look at 1 Corinthians 15.56 for a minute. I want to see what that says. 1 Corinthians 15.56. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The strength of sin is the law. That's where sin gets its strength from, is the law. So when you put yourself under the law to try to obtain righteousness, you're going to fail. Because Christ has already done everything in obedience for you. Now, that doesn't mean that you, have, you can't be obedient. That's not what it's saying. Don't run to the other extreme of that. But what I'm telling you is, 
is that when these people come out with these commentaries, don't believe everything you read. It's so important in hermeneutics that you make sure that you know how to interpret the Bible. And that's what this class is all about, to teach you how to read the Bible. Now, some people are super spiritual, you know. They say, well, I got the Holy Ghost, and that's all I need. I just need the Holy Ghost. I don't need to, uh, have, uh, I don't need to read other extra books. I just got me in the Bible and the Holy Ghost. Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> that's how more cults start, inexperienced start, Now, I'm not saying you have to have a master's degree or a Ph.D. to understand the Bible. But what I'm saying to you is, is that don't think for one minute, and I, I, I hated this all my Christian life. People say I'm self-taught. I'm self-taught. You're not self-taught. Have you been in a room all by yourself, no TV, no, no influence, no school, no first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, kindergarten, uh, grammar school, high school? You, you, you're self-taught? Mommy and daddy didn't teach you right from wrong? Not to poop in your diaper? Not to lie? Not to cheat? Not to steal? Come on, somebody. Everybody has learned something from someone. No man is an island. And even if you pick up a book and you read and you, and you learn from it, you're not self-taught. The person that put their time and effort into that book taught you. So if you've ever read a book, you're not self-taught. Come on, somebody. But do you understand what I'm saying as far as the book of Romans was concerned in that passage of Scripture? I wanted to show you that tonight, not to pick on Jimmy Swaggart. I'm not here to do that. Please don't get the wrong impression. I'm not here to do that. I'm here to show you how not to interpret the Bible by suggestive input. Well, Paul wrote this when he was a young Christian. Where do you get that? My, 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 my question would be, where is the source of information that you got that from? And then you find out that he was 10 years old, he was 10 years in the Lord before he wrote that. So he wasn't a baby. He knew. He was a Jew. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews of the tribe of Benjamin. He knew God's word. He knew about the law. He knew about trying to keep the law and trying to be made righteous. He knew all about that. Christ gave him the revelation of the cross. And yet, the commentary says Paul didn't understand the cross. Really? Now, I'm not telling you not to listen to his music. And I'm not telling you to listen to anything he says. But just go with, a, with an ear to hear and to listen and to discern between what is of God and what isn't of God. Because he's got a lot of great commentary in there. There's a lot of things. I got, I got a couple of, I got, I think, one commentary that he has done. That's excellent. Not, but I don't agree everything that's in it. Just like I have several hundred commentaries that they say things today that I don't agree with. There's scholars that say that once saved, always saved. I don't believe that. There's some scholars that say the rapture is going to happen at the end of the tribulation. I don't believe that either because I don't find that in Scripture. And we talked about that. The only way we can justify that is if we bring a mystical interpretation or an allegorical interpretation to Scripture and change the literal meaning. We can't do that. If I said to you, I got in my car yesterday and I went to the store and I bought a gallon of milk, you can't say to me, oh, Pastor Bob went in his car, he went and got a gallon of milk and he gave it to Bob Lewis because he likes milk. That's a Assumption. Okay? Nowhere in my 
context of what, I, what was said, that pastor went in his car, went to the store, and got a gallon of milk. Nowhere in that statement does it say that I stopped and gave it to Bob Lewis, because he likes milk. And he does like milk, by the way. Okay. Well, would you understand what I'm saying? That's how you can change things. You can change the meaning. But before, when it gets to, when somebody says, oh, Pastor Bob stopped in his car and got milk and he gave it to Bob Lewis. Oh, really? He gave it to Bob Lewis? Really? Before you know it, it goes all around that I stopped and gave Bob milk. And it's nowhere true. But if you put your meaning into something and you add to it, you change the whole context of what it says. And so in this particular portion of Scripture, in chapter 7, he goes on and he says, But sin taken occasion by the commandment wrought in me all... Wrought, uh, let, me see, let me see. But sin taken the occasion, verse 8 of chapter 7, But sin taken occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. Verse 9. For I was alive without the law once. When was that? Here's where you need to, remember when I told you sometimes you need to read the scriptures with the Jewish spectacles? You've got to read them with Jewish glasses on? In the Jewish community growing up, a Jew, a boy, a little boy, Jew, he would not be responsible for sin until his bar mitzvah. Once he had his bar, whoops, once he had his bar mitzvah, he was at the age of accountability. Now he was accountable for sin. Now he was. Now he was. Now he understood the law. And when law comes, Paul says, "Watch." But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. That has nothing to do with him talking about his Christian experience. He still, remember, let's classify it. Let's qualify it. Who's he talking to? Where did you get that from? Was it from me? Where would you get it from? Where? What scripture did you get that from? Come on, you. Where's your Bible? Can you see that? I said, where did it state that he was talking to the Jews? You, I said, who's he talking to? You said the Jews. I said, where does it say that? Back in verse 1 of chapter 7. Go back to verse 1 in chapter 7 so they can, they can see it again. Go to verse 1. You know, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he lives. He's talking to the Jewish believers who are still struggling with becoming righteous through the obedience of the law. So Paul is nowhere describing himself as a Christian that he can't do anything that he, to please God. That's, that's, that's not even close. Then verse 11. I'm sorry, verse 10. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death, for sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. What was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold unto sin. Now he uses the, he uses the, he uses the, um, the first person there. But I am carnal, sold unto sin. When was he carnal? When he was under the law. He was carnal trying to perfect himself in righteousness 
as a, not as a Christian, but as a Jew. You see that? Even though he's using I am, Connell, he's not describing his present state as a, as a Christian, but he's describing himself in the, in the, in the uh, arena, if you will, of being under the law as a Jew. Remember, he's talking to the Jews. For that which I do not... For, look, okay, listen. For that which I do, verse 15, I allow not. For what I would that do, I not. But what I hate that I do. So here's my question to you. Paul hated, Paul hated, okay, homosexuality. He hated adultery, fornication. He hated drunkenness. He wrote all about those things, right? So, according to the scripture, for that which I hate, that I do. If this is true, that he's a Christian doing all these things, how can it be? So he's describing himself as under the law. Come on. Amen? If then I do that which I would not command the law, it is good. Now then, there's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh, in the carnal nature, in the old nature, a person who is a sinner. Now here's another topic. Okay. How many here are sinners? Raise your hand. Okay, I want you all to stand up so I can get you saved. Okay. If you're a sinner, that means you're still living in your sinful nature. You have not a new nature. That You don't have the nature of God living in you. I didn't ask you if you still had a sinful nature. You understand what I'm saying? I asked you if you were a sinner. Now, I thought we were saints. Okay. A sinner is a person who is still under the control, still living in the sinful, unregenerated nature. <clears throat> That's who a sinner is in the biblical definition. So I'll ask the question again. How many here are sinners? You purposely, intentionally go out and sin and do whatever you want to apart from what God has already revealed. Okay, you're called to be saints, separated, separated unto holiness, separated unto righteousness, separated unto, not that we're perfect, but we move on toward perfection. We want to be obedient. Our heart wants to be obedient. We want to be obedient to the, to the Lord. But if you try to obtain that righteousness by your own deeds, the, by the law, it says the strength of the law is uh, the strength of the sin of sin is the law. You put yourself back under bondage again. Now, that doesn't mean oh good whoopie do okay I'm a Christian now I'm not in the sinful nature I can go and do whatever I want to. Mm, that's not what it means. Now that you're a Christian, now that you've accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, now He has given you a new nature. Right? The Bible says therefore. If any man be, or woman, be in Christ, he is a, a new creature. Oh, you're a creature. Did you know you're a creature? That you're a new creature. All things are passed away. That word passed away or pass away means die, dead. Can I ask you something? You're all sitting here, and I don't think all of you have died. If I'm talking in the physical, natural realm, how did you die? 
How did you all die? Come on, speak it out to me. How did you die, sweetie? Tell me, how did you die? Huh? <laughs> the devil nature guy? The devil nature. How did, how did, you, how did you die? Where? Where in the Bible is that? Well, I know where it is. You're questioning me like I don't know where it is. I know where it is. I'm asking you, do you know where it is? That's why it's so important to memorize. What is it? Where is it? No, that's, that's the other one. That's in Galatians. Oh, boy, you guys. See, he makes an excuse. I'm not Jack Van Impey. Nobody asked you to. You should know this. I'm going to tear up all your certificates in uh, Romans. You all should, huh? Nope. Get this in your spirit, man. Chapter 6 of Romans. Verse 6. Put that up there for me, brother, please. See, you guys back there, you're all grinning back there because I ain't calling on you, but, you know. Oh, yeah? I, I, that's what I thought you probably knew of that. 6-6. Six, six. Romans 6-6. Six, six. No, can you put the NLT version up there? I want to see what that says. We know that our old sinful selves were, that's past tense, right? Crucified with Christ. So that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. Therefore, you are no longer a sinner in that qualification, in classification. Now, therefore, you do have a sinful nature. Still in there. And I've seen when you're driving, when you haven't seen me, when somebody's cut you off, how you respond. So we do have the sinful nature. And we do at times fail, right? Okay, now, how many here are sinners? Raise your hand. You all got that now? You all understand that now? So that's why when I, when I hear people say, oh, I'm only a sinner saved by grace, I said, well, maybe you're not saved. You still living in sin? Huh? What are you talking about? Well, you're saying I'm a sinner. A sinner is one who is controlled by their sinful nature. One who has not been translated from the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light. It's a person who is still living in that sinful propensities and obeying those propensities with no thought of ever changing. See, that's the difference between religion and relationship. When you have a relationship with Christ, you want to change. And we do fall, and we do falter. But we don't live in sin. The Bible says, if any man say he knows him and continues in sin, he's a liar, and the truth is not in him. So if a person uh, comes to Christ and says he's a Christian, yet he goes out to the nightclubs and drinks and gets drunk, and goes and sleeps around with everybody, and goes home and comes on Sunday morning and says he's a Christian. He's not a Christian. And I hear this whole time, oh, but they love the Lord. No, they don't. You're not a sin. You, 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 you. If you're a Christian, you have a new nature. 
And I'll go to say this, the new nature doesn't sin, right? Can't sin, the new nature can't sin. Why would God give you a nature that could sin when you already have one? So that's why he says, put off the old man and put on the new man. You have to do that. And how you do that is by submitting to the cross. How you do that is by submitting to what Christ has already done on the cross. So if you're struggling with something, what you need to do is take it to the cross. Don't try to overcome it in the flesh because that's keeping the law. And the Bible says that the, that, that the law is what gives sin its power over you. How many times before you were a Christian, be honest now, you made a New Year's resolution? I don't know who sang that song, right? I want to see a revolution. What was this? What? Resolution something. What was that? What was that? What? Who was that? Queen? Who? The Beatles? Was it the Beatles? No, I said revolution. Yeah. The song was resolution? No, it was revolution. Yeah. <laughs> No, but um, give me that scripture in Corinthians. Somebody find it for me. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. You got it, Bob? I know Bob's up there for East Fast. Google is his friend. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Hey, there it is. Okay, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Isn't that great? Well, has it happened to you? You become a new person. Are you a new person? How are you a new person? Give me the kindergarten version of your being a new person. What's the first kindergarten experience that you experienced as a new Christian? You're born again, yeah. But what, what have we been talking about in the context of what we're talking about tonight? You are not a sinner anymore. Do you follow what I'm saying? You're not living in sin anymore. The old is gone. The old is no longer in control. You have a new controller. You have a Holy Spirit living in you that will convict you when you're doing something wrong. Amen? It bothers you. You know, there's a commercial on TV. I don't know if you've seen it. It's an Ikea commercial. And the lady's shopping, and she's got, oh, like, I don't know how many bags, right? And she, she goes to the register, she pays the register, she looks at the receipt, and she just looks like this, and she starts walking out of the store fast, right? And she's walking outside, and she says to her husband, Stop the car! Stop the car! Stop the car! Stop the car! Okay, and she gets in the car, and she's like, Woo! Woo! Because she thinks she got a, they made a mistake. She's not, she got everything for, like, 50% cheaper. Well, it was a sale. That's why she got 50% cheaper. But how do we do that as a Christian? When you walk into a Dunkin' Donuts and you give her a $5 bill and she gives you change for 20 Now, some Christians still living in their sinful nature, <laughs> okay, would go, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus just blessed me with 15 extra dollars and a cup of coffee. 
But if you're a real Christian, not controlled by your sinful lust, and, and when I say lust, I don't mean sexually, I mean lust for money or whatever it may be, guess what happens? You go, um, excuse me, ma'am, you made an error. I, you know, I gave you, I gave you twenty. I gave you five dollars. You gave me change for twenty. Um, yeah, and then they look at you. <laughs> what was it that we bought at Stop and Shop one time when we bought it back? The lady looked at us like that. How about this? You get, you get, yeah, you get stuff in your bag, right? And you, you know how you check your receipt, right? And you say, okay, vitamins, seven ninety nine. You look on the slip, no seven ninety nine. Would you be like the lady? Get in the car! Get in the car! <laughs> or would you be like, no, this is not right? See, because now you have a conscience. Yeah, it happened at Louis. Well, that was kind of my fault too. We went to Louis. We went, to, we went to Louis for for dinner, and, and uh, but it was my fault, kind of, because I kind of threw a little curve to the guy. He was a new guy; he was just starting out. And I told him I was a pot owner of the of Charlie's, you know, and I I get a discount. <laughs> just kidding with him, you know. I didn't think he would give it to me, but it was like twenty seven dollars of food with a, for eleven bucks, and he said oh, it's eleven dollars, and I went eleven dollars. And then Louis come out and goes, "What are you doing? How much food? What did he get?" That's twenty-seven dollars. That's not eleven dollars. <laughs> he says, "Good thing these people are honest." <laughs> but you see, there's a newness to you. Paul understood that. Paul understood that. There's no way that Paul could write the truth uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and say, "It is no longer I that liveth, but Christ lives in me." If he was doing those things he hated, if he was doing those things that were not right, if he couldn't live a Christian life, how could he say that it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ lives in me? It would be impossible. Did you want to say something? Oh, I thought you, oh, I th I thought you were like saying hello. Now, again, I want to, I want to really, really emphasize this. I didn't bring this out to... Bash Jimmy Swaggart. I just used this. I found this as a, a way of giving you a lesson of how not to interpret Scripture. Do not put your own thoughts into the, into the Scripture because you do it injustice, and before you know it, you'll be labeled a heretic, a false teacher, teaching false doctrine. It's not true. And if you go back and you ask any Jew, they'll tell you exactly what I'm telling you about being under the law. He's describing himself under the law. Yes, he's using present tense, but it's not because he's, he's, a, he's, he's, he's living this way. It's because he's under the law. He's describing himself under the law. He says, the things I want to do, I don't do. Under the law, not under grace. Any questions? Deep in thought, Vicky. I see it up there. It's kind of circling around. Do you have a question? Just trying to take it all in after a hard day's night, a uh, hard day's work? Any questions anywhere? Well, Pastor, does it mean that if I, if I, do the same sin one week and then another week that I'm not saved. No. It just means you have a difficulty in understanding on how to be free from that thing. And you should be asking the question to the Lord, God, how can I be free from this? Why do I do this? You know, sometimes, you know, you know, I don't remember, I don't know if you remember Jeannie, little Jeannie used to come to our church. So she was precious before she passed away. But we went to clean her house out. Oh my God. She was a pack rat. Everything I think she saw on QVC she bought. In her rooms, 
in her rooms, no quite no, I don't know, was you there? Did you get to see that? Yeah. But if you went into her house, she had boxes and boxes from floor to ceiling, filled rooms with stuff. Can I tell you something? Lonely people spend money because it makes them feel good for the moment. If they're feeling lonely, they're feeling depressed, they're feeling down about themselves, they go and they buy something. Oh, it's nice, you know, it's good. And then, and then it only lasts a short time. Then you see them put that thing away, and it's in a box in a, in a closet somewhere. Why not deal with why? Why not deal with the root? Why not deal with that which is causing that? It's the truth. Any other questions? Suggestions? Throw tomatoes, something. Yes. Yes. 